have entitled this Ezekiel and Me. On the last day of January 2014, I died. I was having emergency surgery when my heart stopped and I've lost a huge amount of blood. On the 1st of February that year, the surgeon who had saved my life sat beside my bed and talked to me about the day he thought I'd never see. I've literally been charged to live. I already had complex disability needs, a lot of care support, a very adapted home. I was running a busy church that would build from scratch both building and members. Things have been in a bit of a turmoil because of people's perception of a priest with degenerative disability who mostly arrived most places with a couple of carers. Also, I've uh, rocked corners of an institution or a couple of institutions that didn't really want to be rocked as I've started to talk about my experience of being abused as a child and raised some questions about uh, that and the impact it's had on my life and historically other people's lives. However, I knew on the morning after what I'm going to refer to as my resurrection that I needed to step back from parish ministry and listen very carefully to the divine. I found myself attached to a special bed with all sorts of wires and tubes bringing nutrition and medication in and taking it out again. I was now totally dependent on those caring for me. At this point, I fell in love with Ezekiel. Like Ezekiel, I was the bed-based prophet. The wheels with eyes that I dreamt of were not the primitive yet prophetic chariot wheels of which Ezekiel himself spoke, but intelligently designed wheelchair wheels that could glide me over all terrain. But who were the tribes I was called to engage with? What was my food to be? And how was it going to be prepared? Remembering, Ezekiel thought his carers would need to pick his lunch over human excrement. Who would deal with my bodily waste and intimate hygiene and at whose expense? Yes, would you believe stepping out of role as a parish priest meant stepping out of a 24-7 care funding arrangement between myself, the local authority, and access to work, and wondering what would happen next. The frustration and the wisdom of learning to be totally dependent on others for the most basic of needs is complex. Learning to express and depend on them for complex and sophisticated help, practically, socially, physically, and at times mentally, can be exhausting. Leaving the adapted home, the vicarage, and living with the prejudice that rather than looking for a disabled successor, all the modifications were going to be ripped out of that home before the interview process began. Well, they weren't going to want another cripple in charge of that church community after one had built it all from scratch, were they? On the upside, I have to say, I love my successor. He's a wonderful man and I've enjoyed praying with him in recent months and passing the baton on. But I, a disabled person, had built that church from scratch. The first church on Europe's largest privately funded housing development, Chafford 100. Months of applications and appeals around funding, finding and, adap and adapting a new home, and we did it. So I moved on. My tribes began to emerge. My circles of friends have always been neurologically diverse. My ministry creative and geared more towards the mystical than the administrative. I offer chaplaincy and therapy services within residential care and supported living projects. I'm working to see people with learning disabilities trained to offer therapeutic pastoral and sacramental support within their own environment and beyond. I pursue with a passion art and vintage photography, life coach, and offer spiritual direction. I built my new business, laying in bed, using an iPad. My first client worked with me over Skype. As care funding and work-based support fell into place, and decent adapted equipment and transport came along, 
so did greater geographic opportunities, including a wonderful disability and theology conference in Rome in June this year. I now live by a seaside of sorts, my seaside. I live and love living on Canby Island. Good ale, good pies, and good old-fashioned, if not quite inclusive, excellent as, as company. I don't need a glass of whiskey to get to sleep at night anymore. I'm not stressed, anxious, and depressed like I was at times for years within a parish context. I'm happy and I enjoy living in the presence of Christ. I have to say I do worry about many of my so-called non-disabled colleagues in parish ministry who drink and smoke heavily and suffer from depression and various other health issues that they're terrified to seek help for. How do we hold all that in balance with a God who has called us to have and enjoy life and life to the full? My tribes are those who, like me, are differently wired. I work with people who are non-verbal and selective mute, people on the autistic spectrum, people with Down syndrome, people with dementia, people who are non-binary in terms of gender, and people whose different wiring means they find security in alternative lifespans, and some who all of the above would apply to. I've enjoyed giving some even in this room space to say I don't want to adult today, and that's fine, autistic or otherwise. Sacred spaces take many forms, from ball pools and teddy bears to action man, plastic and physical, and maybe a bit of wild camping. Like the Five Minute Shakespeare Company, I give you a five minute sketch of my new life beyond death and beyond parish ministry. Someone from Pagan Federation said, if I left parish ministry, my priesthood would follow me. I did, and it did. I'm going to start by telling you about Z. Piano and speech. A university student at a Russell Group University on the autistic spectrum. Selective mute. And having fully entered into a non-verbal world. We worked together for three months, drawing pictures, passing notes on paper, playing games, but mostly we played the piano. Zed would sit at the bass end and me at the treble. They would play angry notes and I would play what felt like a response, bird call like. Interestingly, we're both also hearing impaired. The music would get increasingly complex, I'd say argumentative. Zed's mum, who sat in on the sessions, would frequent, frequently cry in realism and amazement at the depth of communication. After one session, we were passing notes in a notebook. Zed picked up the notebook, threw it across the room, and then spoke for quite a long time. That was the last time we met. I'd served my purpose. Those meetings, and have, during those meetings, an extraordinary healing, well, I'd say extraordinary journey had taken place. I won't say healing because Zed was always fully themselves, but I do say holistic peace leading to a more fulfilled life. Now I'm going to tell you about Anne. Thunderstorm and car crash. I knew that. Em had a lot going on in his head, in his 60s, with Down syndrome, in residential care and supported living since teenage years. After his sister, who had become his main carer, couldn't manage his bowel incontinence. And it's actually not that big deal when well and routinely managed that those of us with complex disabilities can testify. I believe that that's why God expected Ezekiel and his carers to robustly deal with human excrement before God upgraded the care package to a different kind of fuel. On a hunch, I created a thunderstorm in Em's kitchen. Tin trays and watering cans. Four residents joined in. 
and all became highly emotional. Staff were confused and would have liked to have stopped the session, but had been asked to stay out of the way. After the storm, M started to engage with the art materials I'd laid out. He painted a vivid picture of a car crash. He, through this, found voice, emotional release, and inner strength. And he told the story of a car crash in his childhood, where relatives had died. He was a stronger person, a more peaceful person, a highly intelligent and pastoral individual. My latest project is in enabling him to enjoy romance without judgment. I will simply say it's shocking the length that people in the care industry will go to to prevent normal behaviour in institutionalised adults. I have strong views on behaviour modification techniques used on adults with learning disabilities and maybe some of us can talk off the record about those. And, and I'm going to have to, with respect to him, and I've talked to him about this, use his name, otherwise the story won't make sense. M, theology and trauma. Nicodemus has dementia. I believe his main issue is post-traumatic stress. He was in the Navy and then a mercenary in Palestine. People in his home were amazed that he and I found common ground and had lengthy conversations. I've been led to believe that he didn't speak. He loved to read, he does love to read, complex war and science fiction books of that name. I printed off for Nick, Nicodemus, John chapter 3, the story of his namesake. Well, my non-verbal dementia patient took me on one of the most profound theological reflections of my life, ch challenging my understanding of the Pharisee and of evil as a complex. As a, as a concept. We have profound weekly meetings. He is only 68 and in different circumstances could be a Greek Orthodox academic theologian. During one of our recent meetings, he commented about how robust the New Testament was in short and harsh sounded Greek and how he believed Jesus would be disappointed about the way his message came across in flowery Latin and worse still, later, English. A story of childhood abuse in a violent home leading to mil military service. A story of a dementia home as a place of sanctuary and healing and sacred space between the shopping channel and the loop of Vera Lynn on the CD player in the background. There are over 20 such stories like this about people I've worked closely with over the last couple of years and I'm currently seeking sponsorship from the Arts Council or anybody else who may be interested in order to expand and document and grow the work. I can give you leaflets and contact cards and I'm excited now to take on new projects and train other people to do likewise. It's a journey that began with a type of death a type of blood outpouring, and it's led to an abundance of life. At our weakest and most dependent, God moves in power. And I end by encouraging the church to enable its weak and vulnerable, both lay and ordained, to positions of wise and strategic leadership. Sometimes, I'm tired and weak and back in that bed, but this is a valuable part of the process, the, prof the prophetic reconnect. From a point of total weakness, Ezekiel designed infrastructure and transformative culture from his bed. Don't forget the bed-bound prophets of today, some of whom are members of your church, and living in your community. God is.